Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 18th episode of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, a podcast all about the subject of antinatalism created by antinatalists. My name is Amanda Oldfan Sukunik, also known as Forever Wolf Films on YouTube, and today I'm speaking with renowned antinatalist historian and the author of several books on the subject, most recently, Antinatalismus ein Handbook, Kareem Akerma. Uh, so welcome, Kareem. Thank you so much for being my guest today on Exploring Antinatalism. Hello, Amanda. Thank you so much for having me on your famous antinatalism podcast. Hello, everybody. Uh, the honor is all mine. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm so excited to talk to you today. Um, so let me start out by just asking you uh, just some basic questions about yourself. Um, in your words, uh, who is Kareem Akerma? Who is Kareem Akerma? Kareem Akerma is somebody who propagates non-propagation. In other words, Kerry McCormer, I am somebody who is in favor of non-procreation. How to do this? Um, I have developed a simple method. I would ask people the following question. Um, do you agree, I would ask, that except in cases of self-defense, we must never act in such a way that a person, a person will die as a consequence of our action. Um, normally, everybody will agree. Mm -hmm. Then I will add, but if we procreate, we have acted in such a way that a person will die. Right. Inevitably, what do you make out of this? And that is where people start thinking antinatalism is serious. Yeah. Whenever we have acted in such a way that a person will die, we contradict our most basic um, ideas. Right, absolutely. You get them to start thinking about the fact that they're not thinking it through all the way. And they're, yes, it's, absolutely. It's like, yeah. a lit, it's like an antinatalistic litmus test, if you like. Yes, I like that, even just as a concept. Yes, very interesting. OK. Um, uh, how did you become interested in the subject of antinatalism? Well, I guess I've always been um, affected by sentient beings suffering, by people suffering, by animals suffering, even yeah. as a child. I, I noticed some people around us, around me, some animals are suffering. I didn't have the faintest concept of antinatalism um, yet when I was mm -hmm. a child. Um, later on, at around 17, the age of 17, I got into contact with um, Buddhism as one of my teachers was a Buddhist. Okay. And I still remember uh, when I was 17, I asked him if the concept of um, not suffering is so important for Buddhism, mm -hmm. why aren't Buddhists in favor of non-procreation? And my teacher didn't have any good answers for me. Yeah. So um, as um, the time was passing by, and uh, since we at school had already been made familiar with um, the atrocities of Auschwitz, yeah. um, I developed the concept not of antinatalism, since I didn't know the word yeah. when I was much younger, but the idea we must stop procreation. Yeah. That is how the whole thing developed in the last half century. Okay, fascinating. Yes, uh, amazing that you had such clarity at such a young age. I mean, I myself had inklings of procreation being wrong, uh, but I wasn't wasn't quite formulated as solidly in my brain at, at that age, at least. Um, though you've sort of answered this question in a, in a different sense. Um, may I ask? You know, do of course do I know the answer to this question? But do you yourself identify as an antinatalist? Uh, and if so, why are you an antinatalist? Yes, I identify as an antinatalist. Um... I tell people I am an antinatalist, yeah. and very often I'm, I am surprised uh, that people do not shy away. For example, yeah. I live in a, in a neighborhood where there are many children. Most of my neighbors do have children, but um, strangely enough, they don't see an, an enemy yeah. in myself. They don't shy away. Um, they talk about antinatalism. Of course, um, there are other examples. Um, 
when people do not want to listen and behave in a rude way once yeah. they get familiar with my anti-naturalistic convictions. Yeah, definitely. I, I, my, I, my, I myself have sort of experienced the gamut of reactions. It's like some people get really, really upset, but then there's so many people who are so fascinated by it and want to talk about it. And it's not the reaction that I think most antinatalists expect, you know, that people actually will be interested. Definitely. And it's, it's, it's people from, from all walks of life. It's not yeah. the case that university people listen to antinatalists, but mm -hmm. the man or the woman on the street wouldn't listen to you. But um, more often than not, it's, it's, um, it's not non-university people who are able yeah. to listen and to digest antinatalist, antinatalistic ideas. Right, which is very fortunate because antinatalism should belong to everybody. Um, how does your antinatalism intersect for you with other subjects such as atheism, veganism, and the right to die? That's a good one. Uh, first, atheism. Um, for In the West, for many th centuries, um, there was the concept of an all-powerful God. Yeah. And being all-powerful means um, knowing the future. Um, he could have done otherwise. He could have refrained from, from creating the world. Mm -hmm. So um, being an atheist, I am of the opinion it's our own du duty. We as human beings have the duty to defend procreation, whereas in former times and when and where people are religious, um, they used to say, well, um, it's in the responsibility of God. He created the world and is, it's according to his will mm -hmm. that everything thing happens. And then, of course, most importantly, um, as a non-atheist, as a, as a religious person, you have paradise. Yeah. You have paradise which will compensate for many sufferings that befall people. Mm -hmm. So being an atheist, um, and everybody who is an atheist, has yeah. the duty to render, to deliver, what I call an anthropodicy. Mm -hmm. Religious people have the duty to render, to elaborate um, a theodicy, a justification of the omissions or deeds of God, mm -hmm. whereas Myself, I, and other athe atheists, non-believers, have the duty to justify um, our having children. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a atheism. Um, I think you also asked for, for veganism. Veganism and the right to die, yes. Yes, the right to die. Um, it's very important when we started to exist. Yeah. Um, we had no chance to say no to it. Yeah. We weren't asked. So, um, at least as regards the end of our life, we should have our saying. And yes. we have the possibility to have a say. We can stop our lives theoretically at any point in time. And that is... Um, a bit of um, a bit of justice when it comes to questions of the beginning and the end of a life. Yes. Now, veganism, veganism, or even vegetarianism is mm -hmm. very important yes. to me. To my mind, vegetarianism and even more so, veganism are practiced antinatalism. Yes. Because. The, the more people re refrain from eating meat, the more um, suffering animals will be created, will be fattened up, will be slaughtered, will be transported. Therefore, um, the two varieties, with um, veganism being more strict, mm -hmm. um, are practice antinatalism. Yeah. Um, it's very important to keep in mind that billions and billions of sentient beings are around us and uh, left on their own, but we can do yeah. something about it. We can practice antinatalism by being vegans or vegetarians. Absolutely. Well, I could not agree with you more on all three of those counts. So excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, 
from what I understand, you've been writing on the subject since at least, uh, and I could be getting these dates a little bit wrong, 1995 or 1997. I'm not exactly sure. Um, however, antinatalism as a word hasn't been around for very long at all. Um, it was really first used as a philosophical term, as you know, since around 2006. So when was the first time you heard the word antinatalism? It's a very difficult question. I'm not quite sure. It might have been between... 2006 and 2009. Okay. 2009 because that was uh, the year when I became familiar with um, David Benatar's book, Better okay. Never to Have Been. Yeah. I must admit that unfortunately um, I didn't I didn't notice uh, that book before. It took me three years after its publication to be even aware of its ex existence, yeah. which is in part due to the fact that here in Germany, antinatalism isn't popular at all. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's not, antinatalism is not taught at universities. There is no um, translation of yeah. David Benatar's book. Um, no sooner had it been published than I wrote um, 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 a review about it. Okay. But as far as I know, in all those years which have passed since uh, 2009, there has been no second review of his, of his great wow. book, which is, which is unbearable, actually. Yeah, I can imagine. So it might have been between 2006 and 2009 when I was um, searching the internet intensely for antinatalism, for the content of antinatalism, yeah. that I might have stumbled upon the, the word antinatalism. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I definitely want to ask you more later on about, you know, antinatalism okay. specific yes. to Germany, because that is very, very fascinating. Um, and I haven't known very many antinatalists from Germany. Um, so yes, I, I'm uh, very interested in your insight into that. Um, okay, so now I'd love to begin a discussion of your of your books. So you've been the author of three books on the subject of antinatalism, uh, all in German, if I'm not mistaken. Now, sadly, because of both the availability and the language barrier of these works, I myself have not been able to read them, although I would certainly love to. Um, you know, for those reasons alone, I'm, I'm you know, so excited to get to speak to you about these works today. Um, your first book on the subject, if I'm not mistaken, now, can you help me with the name? Uh, yes. I, I don't want to mispronounce it horribly. Yes, it's called, uh, in German, it's called Soll eine Menschheit sein, which translates as Should Mankind Exist? Mm -hmm. Its subtitle is um, Eine Fundamental Ethische Frage, um, a Fundamental Ethical Question. Um, okay. That book was published in 1995. Okay. It's only about 100 pages. And um, in that book, I, I, I raise the question of whether or not human beings should exist. And uh, I am searching for, um, for a defense, for defenses mm -hmm. of, uh, of procreation yeah. without finding any defenses, any valid, any convincing defenses. That was in uh, 1995. Wow. Um, two years later, um, I wrote or I accomplished um, Verabben der Menschheit, Mankind's Ebbing Away, okay. which has um, an important subtitle. I should have taken the subtitle as uh, the main title because it is as, following, as follows, um, Niganthropy and Anthropodicy. Okay. Yeah. And um, that book um, served as my postdoctoral thesis. Okay. In Germany and as far as I know, in Switzerland and Austria and German speaking countries, if you want to become a university teacher, you not only have to write a dissertation and to defend it, mm -hmm. on top of that, you have to write a so called habilitation, a postdoctoral thesis. Okay. That thesis got rejected in the year 1997 okay. by a tiny majority of five professors against it and four professors in favor of it. Now, that is, it's very rare, rare at U German universities that an already written postdoctoral thesis gets rejected because normally um, your 
your your doc your university father as they are called here your doc fa your doctoral father okay. will see to it that his colleagues um, accept okay. the content more or less of your postdoctoral thesis. In this case, the anti-natalistic content uh, must have been so overwhelming for his yeah. colleagues that a majority didn't accept it. But um, I kept on working and uh, yeah. finally succeeded in publishing it uh, in the year 2000. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I had known a little bit about the controversy that you mm -hmm. encountered. And, you know, I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. It must have been a very, very hard thing to have. To, I mean, it basically changed your the course of your destiny, so to speak, to have this thing you Indeed, know, shot down because, in the way it was. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, to put it to put it um, in other words, it means you're kicked out of university, even if until then you have been a very promising in the eyes of many university members, a promising future member of university. Yeah. By then I had already uh, led seminars. I had given a number of seminars at the universities of Hamburg and Leipzig. Mm -hmm. But because of the anti-natalistic content, I got kicked out of university. I'm so sorry. Yeah, you paid you've paid a very high price for your antinatalism, which you know is is very unfortunate. Who knows? Maybe it's even better this way because who knows? Had I not been kicked out of university that many years ago, I might yeah. never have written uh, antinatalism a handbook. Who knows? That's no, yeah, that's true. That's a good way of looking at it. Um, and you know, it speaks to your um, how how serious you are about the subject. That no matter what you know happened, these these negative things that happened as a consequence, you you certainly stuck with it and you continue to. So that's very very admirable. I have great respect for you for that. Um, so okay, so the print edition came out in two thousand. I've seen a picture of the print edition, but I've never seen a hard copy of it. Um, do you would you think that there's any possibility of uh, doing a translation of this work at some point into English um, or other languages? Yes, cer certainly. Certainly. Um, I might be interested in doing it myself or engaging okay. somebody else, but I would um, restrict the translation to maybe the introduction okay. and some several chosen chapters from it. I think um, against uh, the background of what I've written in Antinatalism, the handbook, um, mm -hmm. it's not necessary to translate the whole book from the year 2000, even though there are no no overlaps. I tried to write in such a way that there are no overlaps. I see. OK, interesting. Um, perhaps this doesn't uh, relate exactly to this specific work that we're discussing now, but um, just as a question that's come up, uh, I know you've explained in previous interviews a little bit, uh, but can you talk about this phrase that you've come up with and that you use often, the ebbing away of life or ebbing away at humanity, as you call it? Um, can you talk a little bit about this this phrase that you use? Oh, yes, of course. Um, it's an allusion to the movement of the water. OK, yes. There's a, um, a rising tide and the ebbing away of the water. Of course, um, in the case of antinatalism, of um, mankind ceasing to exist, um, the ebbing away is once and for all. There'll be no flood again, hopefully. Maybe on mm. other planets, who knows, but we can discuss that later, perhaps. Um, it's once and for all. It's um, a, met a metaphor. I used that metaphor because I wasn't familiar then with um, the expression antinatalism. Yeah. One could also have, I could also have chosen mankind's phasing out. Yeah. Perhaps it would have been a, an, an alternative. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm always curious about these ways in which, you know, without that language attached to it, you know, people have come up with their own terms for how to describe it. I always find that just fascinating. Yes. It is important um, maybe to know uh, that back then in the year, in the years 95 to 2000 and even later yeah. on, um, as an, as an antinatalist, I felt completely, not completely, but rather isolated. I can imagine. I didn't, I didn't know there would be many antinatalists out there yeah. in other countries, on other continents. That is why, um, um, that is mainly due to the fact that the internet, of course, yeah. we had internet back in 1996, even in Germany, mm -hmm. but um, we didn't use it that much and it didn't have the content it has today. 
Right. Right. Yeah, I think the Internet has done uh, wonders if, if for bringing anti-natalist, anti-procreative people of all kinds together. Um, and even, you know, I started to get involved in 2010 and there were so few of us at that point, you know, um, but there was all this interest, you know, sort of a, a excited interest around it. But now today to look at some of the sizes of the Facebook groups, you know, there's a South American group with 100,000 members or these groups in, you know, uh, based in Egypt and, and Lebanon with, you know, 70,000 members. It's just it's it kind of blows your mind, you know, yes, how it much does. it's grown. Yeah, you know. it's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. <laughs> Um, so I may have made a bit of a mistake um, in in um, saying which of your books was the first and which was the second. Um, but uh, if, am I correct in that perhaps the third was uh, I don't know how to say the the German title, but but it would translate to the beginning of the end of life. Is that is that technically the third one from two thousand six? Uh, that is um, a book I published yes in two thousand and six. Six. Mm -hmm. um, that book deals with um, the question the big beginning and the end of a life. It doesn't directly deal with um, questions of, of antinatalism. Okay, but okay. Um, there, is, there is a certain overlap because in that book I do defend a mentalistic view of um, the beginning and the end of a life. What does it mean, mentalistic ideas of life? Um, I'm asking the question, when does a life start and when does it end? Okay. And in order to answer the question, I raise the question, what are we, you and I, as we are talking to each other, yeah. essentially? And I came to the conclusion that essentially we are embodied minds, mm -hmm. which is to say we are not, we are not self-consciousness. Mm -hmm. We are, we start to begin as soon as our brains start to produce even simple consciousness or primitive consciousness. That translates as we began to exist when our organisms, our embryonic or our fetal organisms for the first time ever, started to, pr to produce consciousness. Mm -hmm. And we will, our, our existence will stop forever once our, our brain has stopped to produce consciousness. So um, this um, insight has, has an overlap with antinatalism because according to the mentalistic view, um, we do not kill early embryos mm -hmm. as long as those embryos do not have any mental properties. Mm -hmm. um, the, right, the right word would be, the appropriate expression would be, we do destroy those embryos. However, we would kill um, a fetus that has consciousness. Mm -hmm. This enables us to, to say, um, we can achieve human beings on earth by um, by abortion as long mm -hmm. as whenever we abort an early embryo we, not, we do not kill anybody mm -hmm. so it's from a moral point of view um, it is it is less dangerous if you like if we start talking about killing fetuses mm -hmm. it becomes a serious moral question mm -hmm. Okay, fascinating. Yeah, I, I, I is um, was this particular work ever like a, a, officially released as like a print edition, like the like the last one? It was. Yes, it's it's uh, it got released in the year two thousand and six, and it's still available. It is still available. Okay, I'll it's have still to, available. I'll have to try to find a copy. Can you can you um say the name of the work in German? Um, Lebensende und Lebensbeginn. Okay, fantastic. Well, I, I, you know, I certainly hope at some point, perhaps that work as well as translated into English. I would love to read it. Um, all right, so I, I think. Okay. Uh, oh yes, of course. Um, so, I, if you wouldn't mind, I would love to um, start talking about uh, your your most recent work, uh, Antinatalismus ein Handbook. I'm probably bu butchering the pronunciation. I'm sure. I do apologize. No, um, I can tell you, every every German speaking person would understand you perfectly well. Okay, well, I'm glad to know that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so your third sub, uh, book on the subject of antinatalism is a book that is both a history book on antinatalism as well as a book dealing with your own philosophical positions and arguments for the subject. The original German edition of the book, for those of our audience that might not be aware, is over a thousand pages long. Um, it covers what I'm told is a truly impressive expanse of antinatalist history. Um, 
in 2017, 2018, there was a fundraising campaign set up by Andreas Moss to uh, raise funds to have this particular book translated into English, along with um, The Art of Guillotining Procreators by Theophile de Garot. Um, and the fundraiser was a was a success. Uh, enough funds were raised. Um, can you tell me what the current progress of this translation is? Yes. First of all, um, I take the opportunity and want to thank everybody who donated for yes. for my book and for Theo's book. Um, it was a great success, which enabled me to to um, yes to keep on uh, getting it translated. Um, the actual German edition comprises 735 pages but oh. you're absolutely right one could easily one could easily have made 1000 pages out of it yeah. if you take if you take 12 point um, 12 point print um, it would have been a uh, thousand pages no, wow. no problem or even more yeah um, yes um, once uh, the fundraiser um, was was done I found myself in front of the question, who is an able translator? Who is able to translate that kind of work? Yeah. And luckily enough, I remembered Dr. Alexander Reynolds, um, a British translator, um, with whom I had been in contact for almost 10 years. And I asked him, could you, could you carry out a sample translation? And his sample translation was overwhelmingly good. Fantastic. And I thought he is second to none. Yeah. And I would I I would be crazy to engage somebody else with um, the translation of that book. So in the course of the last two years, he has accomplished some eighty percent wow. of uh, those two hundred and fifty pages, um, which uh, the English edition edition is set to contain. That's phenomenal. That's it's so 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 exciting. Um, before we uh, talk a little bit more about the translation, can you? Uh, I know it's difficult with such a long work, and I do apologize for getting the page count so 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 wrong. Um, but can you just uh, give give us like a summation of what all is included in the work, everything that it covers? Yeah. Yes, you were absolutely right. Um, the book uh, is a lot about antinatalism's history. Yeah. But at the same time, it's not a history book. Um, of antinatalism. It is different from, for example, Ken Coates' famous book. Yeah. That is a real a, a real history book on the about the history of antinatalism. Um, my book is made up uh, in the manner of, of a manual, which yeah. is to say it has entries ranging ranging from A to Z. Yeah. Um, most entries do not correspond to philosophers names mm -hmm. but to topics okay for for example abortion or animals or um parents okay and then for example if you open the book and you hit parents here you will find a number of of philosophers who have contributed to um internationalistic viewpoints of uh, the topic parents. For, for okay. example, you will find an entry which is called parental guilt. Okay. Or confessions of parental guilt. And then you might stumble upon, upon utterances by Thomas Mann. Okay. Who confessed, believe it or not, who confessed that um, um, he is filled with um, parental guilt, and he often thinks about his parental guilt because he procreated. Okay. And in such manner, um, you may open the book um, under any lemma, um, abortion, and you will find contributions, um, manifestations from writers, philosophers, um, poetry, music, and, 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 and what have you. Yeah. Ah, oh, I want to read it so bad. So, so, yeah. so in, other, in other words, um, uh, um, I'm mainly dealing with um, systematic questions. Okay. And I take history as an as a, as a, as an as an uh, exemplification of um, the systematic aspects or questions. 
in order to, to show that antinatalism is deeply rooted in our culture. Yes. Or at least pre-antinatalism is deeply rooted in our culture. There are countless contributions over the last 2,000 years. There are, you know, just letting our audience know, there are already some portions of the translation, um, you know, up on your website, uh, antinatalismblog.wordpress.com. Um, is the is the plan to ultimately release the new print, uh, new edition, new trans English translation, you know, as a print edition? Is that the ultimate goal, or will it all be on yes. the website? Okay. Yes, definitely. Once it's all on the website, I will, on top of that, and eventually see to it that uh, it becomes um, a printed edition. Okay, which excellent. Should be should be available um, via the internet, so that you can order it. Maybe if you can try to avoid Amazon, but with yeah any other di distribution house. Fantastic. Okay, I'm very excited to hear that. Um, do you, I mean this is the, in the you know long future? I'm sure, but are there any plans to translate this book into other languages? Is that something you would like to see happen? Um. Yes, I, I, I wouldn't say no. I wouldn't say no. I could imagine that um, it might be interesting for for China, for Chinese. Yeah. The Chinese translation might be interesting, and uh, apart from that, a Spanish Spanish uh, translation definitely. might be might be inter interesting too. Arabic, but, um, Arabic. Yeah, it's a good hint. Yeah, Big you time. know, I have <laughs> my first name is Arabic, but I I don't oh. know any Arabic. I don't know any Arabic. Unfortunately, but it's 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 a good hint. I keep that I keep that in mind, and uh, but now that we have, soon will have um, the English translation, I think uh, many people interested in the topic will be able to read it. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, these sections that have already been you know translated and uploaded to the site have in a way sort of feel like they've taken on like a life of their own, you know, as separate works. Um, I'll leave the section on, on Koenig for a little bit. I definitely want to ask you about that. But what can you tell me about the piece entitled Antinatalist Manifesto, which I thought was uh, such a great outline of, you know, what what we are? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the Antinatalistic Manifesto goes back to another German antinatalist oh. who lives in the city of Flensburg, not too far from I'm based in Hamburg. Okay. Um, he has a website which is mainly dedicated to animal rights, okay. but also also to antinatalism. He suggested to me, Karim, um, could you write for our website um, a very concise piece about antinatalism in such a way that everybody will be able to understand it? No philosophical vocabulary, please. No difficult reflections. And I told him, I told him, I'll try my best. And he suggested um, antinatalistic manifesto as a title. Mm -hmm. Only very later, it occurred to me that Théophile de Giraud's famous book on antinatalism has as its subtitle um, antinatalist manifesto. Yeah. And I felt sorry about this because I would have chosen a different a different title had I remembered or had it occurred to me that um, the title does already exist. But I told it to Theo and he was he was all right with it. He was OK. Yeah, I'm sure he wouldn't be angry about that. No. <laughs> and I guess today, nowadays, there are so many antinatalistic uh, manifestos around. Yeah. So it doesn't it doesn't matter anyway. But that is how um, that manifesto came into existence. OK, excellent. Yeah, I very much encourage everybody to go check that out. It's an excellent, excellent uh, summation of, of what antinatalism is and how to, you know, what it is we need to do to move forward. And yeah, um, I've been told a great portion of the history section of the book covers a wealth of information on antinatalism and art, which you mentioned a little bit ago, um, which is of great interest to me personally. Um, can you give me any uh, highlights, I guess, as to what you found to be the history of antinatalism and art? Let me try. I know you're an artist. Yes. Uh, let me try. Um, well, if we talk about internationalism and art, um, I've always been a fan um, of artists who draw pictures in which there are no human beings. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first example I stumbled upon is mm -hmm. a painting by Leonardo, I think, he painted that one in 1473, 
and it's a landscape next to on the banks of River Arno in Italy. Mm -hmm. There are there are some 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 buildings or human structures, but there is no human being to be seen. And um, that for me is a kind of pre-antinatalism or yeah. maybe maybe um, fugism, anthropofugism. Mm -hmm. It's um, to use um, an expression of Ulrich Ulrich Horstmann, a German who isn't an antinatalist, but he's ant anthropofugal the escape from humans. And um, so I discovered there are quite a few other paintings um, which don't show any human beings. And that maybe belongs to um, to pre-antinatalism okay. in art. And I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to elaborate on that subject, but um, I'm, I'm not an expert and I leave it to people like you who, are more, who have more expertise <laughs> to maybe come up um, with um, a study on paintings, on drawings, um, who are free from, from human beings and about yeah. the development of uh, these paintings, which might be interesting. Apart from art, um, there is music. Yeah. Uh, we all know the Beatles. Um, there is a, a song written by John Lennon called She Said. Uh -huh. And in one line of that song, John Lennon says, um, I wish I had never been born. Yeah. Same goes for, for Queen, Bohemian yeah. Rhapsody. Yeah, I was just thinking that. Fred, yes, it's, it's, it's famous, and Freddie Mercury is singing, sometimes I wish I had never been born. Yeah. And uh, then even in opera, there are some, <clears throat> some librettos. I remember one piece written, I think, by Gluck, um, in which similar... Um, similar, similar um, statements are made, not directly antinatalistic, but pre-antinatalistic in the manner yeah. of um, would I had never been born. Right. Yes, that's an important distinction, certainly. Um, and then, la last but not least, of course, you have you have literature. Mm -hmm. um, I've mainly been op occupied with um, literature, novels, and poetry. Yeah. There is a vast an incre incredibly vast body yeah. of examples ranging back to antiquity um, of contributions to antinatalism in novels and, and poetry. And I'm mainly dealing with um, pieces from literature in order to, to exemplify some of my neologisms, if my pronunciation is right, of my neologisms, which I had to, de to develop in order to make more clear my antinatalistic ideas. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I'm so glad that you've, you know, you've begun that research, you know, into into antinatalism in art. And it, it, that is something I would, I, I would actually love to, uh, to pursue, uh, because I do believe that, you know, now that we're past the stage of proto antinatalism into yes. full antinatalism, I think that antinatalism has this huge potential in the artwork of the future as a source oh, of yes, inspiration. Yes, yes, it has. And yeah. if, if, I, if I may, let me let me quickly add, I had yeah. forgotten the the artist's name. It's Caspar David Friedrich, okay. a famous a famous German German painter, mm -hmm. who may be first of all painters um, um, displayed painted landscapes completely void of human beings. He lived, okay. if I'm not mistaken, from uh, 1770 more or less to 1830 maybe. Okay, I'll have to look him up and, and check out those paintings. Okay, fascinating. Um, in an article about your work with, um, and I'm probably going to say this wrong, literaturecritique.de, um, it mentions uh, you ex ex sort of explore both Adorno and Chopin um, as as having had antinatalist leadings, which I wasn't aware of. Can you talk a little bit about the antinatalism of both of those historical figures? Yes, yes. let me perhaps start with um, Chopin. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading a biography about Chopin when all of a sudden I stumbled upon um, a few lines taken from one of his letters in which he says, um, in the manner of um, famous writers in antiquity, I wish I had never been born. Mm -hmm. And he's putting the question, what is worst in life? It's to be born and what is best? It is yeah. to die. That is just um, one piece from from Chopin, which I discovered by accident when reading okay. a biography. Yeah. Um, the case of Adorno is much more difficult. Yeah. 
he's extremely difficult when it comes to anti-natalism. Um, Adorno is famous because he is among the philosophers who took very seriously the atrocities in German concentration camps, yeah. being a Jew himself. So um, against that background, one would expect him to be um, somewhere on the outskirts of antinatalism. Okay. But he isn't. He isn't. In his major work, Negative Dialectics, mm -hmm. he um, broaches the topic of antinatalism when he discusses, wouldn't, wouldn't it have been better for inmates of concentration camps never to have been born? Yeah. Wow. And he plays with um, that question without saying definitely yes. Okay. He says, uh, more or less, it's of no, it's of no, it's useless um, mulling over such questions. And I was mulling over, why on earth isn't Adorno in favor of um, humans' complete abstention from any further procreation? Because yeah. um, the most, the single most important sentence for Adorno was, Auschwitz must never happen again. Yeah. But humankind has to die out in order for Auschwitz or similar right. concentration camps never to happen again. Um, in my view, Adorno is a good example for what I call hu humanomania. Okay. Humanomania is an allusion to being a maniac. Humanomania yeah. in my handbook means um, somebody who wants to continue with um, humanity at all costs. Yeah. And yeah. be it the cost of future concentration camps. Yeah. And uh, when I was much younger, I thought um, people, especially Jewish people, would like my ideas on um, abstention from procreation. Mm -hmm. But then I found they don't. Yeah. According to most people, humanity has to continue at all costs. Mm -hmm. and be it at the cost of future concentration camps. And that is what I call humanomania. Okay, all right, well, thank you so much for that. Um, from what I understand in this English translation that's being done now, you have ultimately made the decision to remove all or most of the antinatalism history portion of the book. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why did you well, do that? <laughs> let me try to let me try to to clarify. Okay. Um, as as we as we said um, a few minutes um, earlier, the German edition comprises seven hundred thirty page thirty five pages, and I could easily have made one thousand pages of it with a different presentation. So um, the from the outset, the English edition should contain fewer pages. Yeah. And I thought two hundred and fifty pages would be would be fine. Mm -hmm. So I had I had to get I had to get rid of many um, pages anyway. And I thought um, I should concentrate on systematic questions, okay. and only here and there should I take quotations from literature, especially as clarifications for the systematic content. So that is the only reason why I had to renounce from taking all those quotations and clarifications. Yeah, no, your, your reasoning makes perfect sense, and I totally understand. At the same time, it is total torture for me that I can't read the history section of your handbook. Um, do I'm you so think, sorry. No, it's okay. I, I, no, your reasons make complete sense. Um, do you think there's any possibility that, you know, later on those portions might get translated into the future? And can the antinatalist community do anything to help make that happen? If there are many people out there who are seriously interested in those passages, which I, at this point in time, cannot imagine. Okay. Because, because many of those quotations are taken from books which appeared 100 years ago, 200 years ago. The style is completely different. Um, it's, it's, it's a different world. So I think it might be, um, it might be bothersome for many people to, to read those quotations and to, to delve into 
long bygone bygone times. But if there is enough interest out there, of course, of course, um, they would prod me and I would I would give my best. Okay, well, that I, I'll take that as a challenge. I will find those people. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Great. Um, aside from the history section and and the material that's already been translated and added to your site, uh, what else do you cover? You know, within uh, Antinatalism Mein Handbook that we maybe haven't talked about yet. Yes. So there is um, the alphabetic order from A to Z. Okay. Um, the the headers are mainly topics, not names. And then I take names throughout history in order to 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 exemplify and to clarify um, the systematic content. That makes up um, ninety percent of the handbook. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, I added three appendices, out of which two are of importance. Maybe the first appendice is um, about. Um, the concept of last min in German literature, mainly in German literature. Okay. Because as I said, I, I, I discovered um, that before philosophy came to grips with um, antinatalism, um, it had it has been quite it had been quite a quite a topic in, in literature. Yeah. There are many last min um, novels out there um, mulling over the question for example, after cas catastrophes, yeah. should we continue the project of mankind? And very often, the content is highly philosophical, yeah. sometimes more philosophical than, than philosophy itself. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to make readers familiar with um, the fact that there are many, many novels out there, some of them out of print. Yeah. Um, the second appendix is about my my reading of Adolf Hitler, Hitler's Mein Kampf. Okay. Oh, wow. Which in Germany still isn't fully available. Yeah. Uh, there is a commented edition available, but you can't, you can't go into a bookstore and simply buy a full edition yeah. not commented of Adolf Hitler. I, 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 I had a copy which had survived from the 30s, I think. Wow. And uh, I read that book because I wanted to understand the Third Reich better. Yeah. And I was flabbergasted when I discovered that um, Hitler's main reason for his hatred against Jews yeah. is that according to him, Jews have an anti-natalistic anti worldview. He really? says, yes, it's, um, I, I wrote I, I wrote this article, mm -hmm. but it never got published. I sent it to historians; they never reacted. Hmm. Um, it's a kind of unwritten content, unthought content of Hitler's Mein Kampf. Hitler was of the opinion that if the Jews took power, yeah, they would um, not continue with um, procreation, and according to Hitler. Uh huh. If the Jews were allowed to take power, sooner or later planet Earth would orbit the sun um, as a sole mass of stone and water, void of any human beings. And that is what he says literally in his Mein Kampf. That's yeah. the reason why I had to extinct the Jewish race. Uh -huh. It's a service, a service to humankind. It sounds unbelievable, but those are his words. Wow. That's a... That's a tremendous find. It is. I can yeah, imagine. that's tremendous. Um, is that part of the book set to be translated into English? Um, I'm sorry to say, but that appendix is not part of the English edition. But... All right. I'm going to have to find these people sooner rather than later. <laughs> okay. All Thank right. You. Well, that's that. That's. That's I, my mind is a little bit blown by that because I had never, 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 never heard that. So extraordinary uh, find. Uh, yeah. Let me explain one more sentence about this. Yes, please. Um, I'm not the first one to to have discovered these okay. utterances of Hitler. Um, I read a few biographies of Hitler, and there are historians who um, make quotations about this. But of course, they have no not the faintest about antinatalism. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. So it's difficult for them to um, to estimate the real um, weight of those utterances of Hitler. Okay, I see. Right, right. Well, it does make it does make one a little nervous what uh, future um, despots will think of actual antinatalism. Yes, um, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, all the more since, as you know, um, there are some people out there who would, if they knew you are vegetarian or vegan, yeah. they would tell you, listen, Hitler was a vegetarian, so vegetarian yeah. vegetarianism must be bad. In yeah. the same manner, some stupid people could come up saying Hitler was... Um, Hitler was um, occupied with um, antinatalism, so antinatalism must be bad. Unfortunately, yeah. there are many people out there who think uh, this way, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, okay, well, uh, moving on from there, I'd like to discuss uh, some more topics in antinatalism history, the history of antinatalism. I spoke with uh, Katerina Lokmoniva uh, last episode. I actually just released that episode today uh, on the podcast. Um, okay. And she and I discussed this idea of proto-antinatalism. And I wanted to know your feeling, what your feelings are on this term. And if you could describe for me uh, what makes some antinatalists, uh, including Schopenhauer, fall under this proto-AN variety, and also what constitutes a more realized form of antinatalism. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think proto antinatalism is a is a very good, it's an excellent concept. Yeah, because um, there seems to be a sharp dividing line between proto antinatalism and modern con modern antinatalism. We uh, proto antinatalism actually reaches back to way into antiquity. We find yeah. proto antinatalistic utterances <clears throat> in the works of um, Sophocles and Euripides, uh -huh. who said um, it would have been better not to have been born, or would I had never been born. And I call that proto antinatalism <clears throat> because if we consider an utterance such as would I had never been born, if you take that ethically, yeah. you have to universalize the sentence. If it is best, or if it had been best, if I had never been born, universalized, universalized equals, it would have been better for anybody, for everybody, not to have been born. Right. So it would have been best if humankind had never existed. Yeah. So already in antiquity, um, there are... Um, antinatalistic germs mm -hmm. that if we universalize them we um, we reach and we reach modern antinatalism yeah Schopenhauer um, wrote shortly before the switch to to modern antinatalism he was a metaphysician yeah. mm -hmm. his whole philosophy um, is highly metaphysical mm -hmm. his most famous book is called um, The World as Will and Imagination. Mm -hmm. And in that work, which I studied intensely, uh, he on just a few occasions um, broaches antinatalism. For example, he once says, um, if everybody followed the doctrine of not having children, mankind would die out. Yeah. And with uh, mankind, the world as imagination would collapse, so that even so even animals would cease to exist. Mm -hmm. But um, Schopenhauer doesn't follow a stringent line, unfortunately. Yeah, he was he was on the verge of antinatalism, yeah. but he didn't have what it takes to to be, to become a full grown antinatalist. Right, <laughs> he was right on that cusp cusp of yes. antinatalism and non-antinatalism. Exactly. exactly. Fascinating. Okay. Um, I asked Katerina nearly this exact question as well, but interested in hearing your thoughts. Um, can you speak a little bit about what effect the eventual concept of extinction had on the history of antinatalism? I know many forms of AN that were of a more, more proto-antinatalist variety really couldn't quite conceive of extinction yet because of the time in history in which they were happening and, and, mm -hmm. and, and other uh, factors. Um, 
but you know, once the concept of extinction sort of came into play, it was you know a bit of a game changer for the concept of antinatalism. So, any thoughts on this you know extraordinary shift in antinatalist thinking that occurred when extinction you know came around as a concept? Well, I think it's a it's a tremendously difficult question yeah. you're putting, but let me try Sorry. to to answer <laughs> n n n nonetheless. Um, in medieval in medieval times, um, there was a concept of God. Yeah. as an almighty entity mm -hmm. and there was a time towards the end of the middle ages especially in the 14th century <clears throat> when uh, people were afraid of god they were afraid of god's um, ability to make the world collapse yeah. in any given moment which is tantamount maybe to to the world's extinction yeah so actually um, medieval men had already already been familiar with um, the extinction of mm -hmm. um, the human race, but that of course never led to antinatalistic concepts. Yeah, except for some reflections regarding um, regarding paradise and afterlife, because some people were indeed asking um, if God is prone to annihilate the whole world, yeah. um, why are there any new souls coming into this world? There are some yeah. thinkers who, um, who were discussing um, similar questions. But okay. please, please, please ask more because I'm not sure if I got, if I got um, the um, link between extinction and antinatalism right. Well, I, I I was sort of under the impression that part part of what separates uh, proto antinatalism from a more you know modern realized form of antinatalism is that a lot of proto antinatalism couldn't conceive of extinction at least insofar as this is something that human beings would cause you know like that that it's a more of a an action that we would you know it's not it's not the uh, eventual. Um, it's not something that God would cause or something outside yes. of ourselves would cause, but something that we would uh, work towards in some sort of way. And that was part of my understanding, at least, of what separates proto-antinatalism from a more realized form. I am I correct in that? Or? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. Now I understand much better uh, what you have in mind. Uh, well, of course, um, with um, the introduction of ABC weapons, yeah. atomic bombs, biological weapons and chemical weapons, um, the destruction of mankind is at the fingertips of at least some human beings, not of all of us, but unfortunately at the fingertips of some human beings. So um, in order to be more quick yeah. than um, mass destruction or a destruction of humanity as a whole, uh, many people might think it would be better not to have children because of course. Why, ha why, why having children yeah. when, uh, when their exis existence is endangered, when there right. might be an atomic war at any point, at any point in time? Therefore, um, the ability of committing extinction should be or should have been very much in favor of um, the development of antinatalism. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, I don't have what it takes. I don't have the necessary data to confirm whether or not there is a link between the ability of extinction and growth of antinatalism. Okay, I understand. But there is a probability from the outset. Judging from uh, Katerina Lakmoniva's uh, recent book, History of Antinatalism, there is some contention as to who, in fact, was the, the first, uh, at least, proto-antinatalist. Though I may be understanding incorrectly, it seems that you believe that the first was Anaxagoras, might be saying his name wrong, amazing name. Uh, who was Anaxagoras, and why do you believe he was the first antinatalist thinker? And, uh, Anaxagoras was a so-called pre-Socratic thinker. He was earlier than so Socrates. Yes. And mm -hmm. as as far as I, I wouldn't I wouldn't see in him a pre antinatalist. Okay. Okay. What he did, um, he was later. He lived uh, after Sophocles and Euripides, who had famously um, made the statement, um, "Would I had never would I had never been." 
Yeah. Or I'd, I had never been born. Mm -hmm. And Anaxagoras asks the, the question, under which conditions, or what does it take? What does it take for us to be able to say life is, is, is uh, worth it? Mm -hmm. And his, his answer is a little bit confounding. What he says is, well, as long as we are, at, as long as we are able to admire the cosmos, um, the starry skies, mm -hmm. life is worth it. Okay. In other words, what Anaxagoras is doing, he is offering an anthropodicy. Yeah. He didn't. He, he as um, as a pre-Socratic -pre thinker, didn't didn't believe in an almighty God. Yeah. There weren't any almighty gods who had created the world out of nothing. Rather, he says um, there are some things out there, the cosmos and its beauty, which make which render life livable. Okay. So therefore, Anaxagoras is maybe the first who offered an, a justification of the continuance of humankind. I see. Okay. Um, so in your opinion, who, who maybe was the first proto-antinatalist? Um, the, two, the, the two thinkers I remember right now are Sophocles okay. and yeah. Euripides, but I remember there is a German um, a German scholar who published a study on the utterance "Would I had never been I had never been born." Yeah. Okay. And um, I remember, without being said, without being able to say, to give you exact exact um, time data, um, he discovered that already in in ancient Egypt, there are a few just a few utterances um, yeah. similar to would I had never been born. Okay. So the first examples of proto-antinatalism reached back way into ancient Egypt, okay. 2000 years before our time. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Which is impressive. Very impressive. Yes, absolutely. So I know about the fact that um, there is, in fact, sort of two separate histories to the to the term antinatalism. Uh, one being the philosophical word that we all you know know and love today, um, and the other having more to do with uh, you know population, sometimes applied by historians to certain you know nefarious practices by the Nazis. This is going back a little bit to what we were talking about before. Um, I've been told on several occasions that some German dictionaries. Um, are some of the very rare few in the world. Korean is the only other one that I've been told where this appears, where the term antinatalism appears to have its own entry. Have you seen um, any evidence of this? And if so, uh, how how do these German dictionaries define the term antinatalism? Mm -hmm. um, I must admit uh, that I'm not very up to, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite up to date when it comes to dictionaries. That's but, all right. Um, I never stumbled upon um, um, the term antinatalism in a, in a printed okay. dictionary edition. Yeah. But um, yeah. I make a living as a translator mm -hmm. and I frequently use a dictionary which is on the internet, which is excellent, yeah. which is called uh, dict.cc. Okay. And there, there you have antinatalism. Okay. There you have antinatalism without having any, any definitions. Interesting. But the term antinatalism made it into internet dictionaries, at least. So far, yeah. Okay. All right. Interesting. Well, maybe perhaps the perhaps the German dictionaries with the you know in print edition with the term is just a rumor. I really don't know. So far, I've never I've heard the rumor many times, but nobody's ever shown me evidence of it. So and, interesting. And, and anyway, uh, as a rule, German dictionaries follow the spoken language, the language with, okay. which is spoken on the street. So if more people right. start speaking about writing using the term antinatalism, sooner or later, uh, printed editions will, um, we'll will, have, will, will present it too. Okay. All right. Excellent. Um, again, going back a little bit to what we were talking earlier with, uh, you know, have you, I, I'm just curious, I mean, have you, have you ever seen any evidence to suggest that the Nazis themselves ever used the term antinatalism? Or was it only, you know, historians that have, you know, applied this term to describe their activities? I know, is it Jack Reynolds? Am I getting that name wrote, right? Uh, wrote a book about such a thing? Uh, for all I know, it's only historians. I thought so, who... yeah use um, the term antinatalism in order to, to describe what the Nazis did. Yeah. 
Considering what you know about antinatalist thinking in the long since past, what would you say have been the biggest factors preventing antinatalism from gaining ground in the world? Like, wh- you know, why is it now becoming more popular? What's taken so long? Why now? That's a, that's a good question. It's a very good question. Maybe um, before you mentioned there are huge Facebook groups, yeah. groups um, on antinatalism. Um, let me dare saying the following. Maybe there have always been hundreds of thousands of antinatalists yeah. everywhere, yeah. but we didn't have the, the internet. Yeah. An, indi- an indicator for that is um, the big body of proto-antinatalist um, literature, yeah. novels and poems, because um, an antinatalist novel is just an indicator. You have to multiply it by at least the factor of 1,000, 10,000, or 100,000. Yeah. Because writers very often are an echo of what everybody's thinking. Yeah. Anyway. So mm-hmm. I, sometimes I get the impression antinatalism has always, has always been there. Yeah. And there have always been millions of people with um, antinatalistic convictions, but um, they never had the ability to communicate or to the ability for some sort of self-understanding as a community of antinatalists. But I might be completely wrong about this. I I frankly think you're right. I mean, I think we have always been been there, but there's been no. I mean, it's it's an opinion that's essentially been oppressed, you know, and that uh, that you know there's and I think also the introduction of that word antinatalism, like the importance of having this word for it, you know, can't be uh, put down. Like it's very very important that all of a sudden there's this thing that you can call these ideas yes. that like yes. you know people run you know are afraid to express, and all of a sudden there's yes. this word. As, yeah. as, as you are saying this, let me perhaps add, yeah. there is a French antinatalist um, who had been writing about the content of antinatalism yeah. ever since the year 1973. Wow. His name is Annaba. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. he invented the expression anti-procreationism. Okay. okay. But as he wrote in French. Yeah. And since he has never been translated into into English or yeah. other languages, nobody was aware of his existence. Damn. And I think the term anti procreationism um, is even more clear it is. than yeah. antinatalism because natalism isn't clear to everybody. Yeah. Whereas procreation, everybody knows what procreation means. Yeah. But then, of course, now we have antinatalism and that is fine. But uh, we, we, we shouldn't forget there were many antinatalistic aspirations around us, sometimes hidden in languages we do not master. And perhaps there are similar um, expressions in Chinese or in the Hindu language, who knows? We still have to find, we still have to find out and time, time will show, time will show. Yeah, that's one of the things I'm, I'm most interested in finding is like, have there, is there, is there language already for this that's, you know, just, we just don't know about yet, so. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, thank you for your thoughts on that. Um, so now I'd like to talk about Koenig. So Koenig is, you know, one of your biggest discoveries, just an absolutely amazing, amazing, amazing find. Congratulations on making such a discovery in, Ker- in Koenig. Uh, who was Koenig and why was he so important to the history of antinatalism? And however did you s- discover this, you know, this important figure uh, in antinatalist history? Koenig was, um, was a windfall. Yeah. Um, I was reading a book about a German philosopher. Um, his name is Eduard von Hartmann. Okay. The book about Eduard von Hartmann was written by a Swiss philosopher. And uh, there was a footnote indicating the existence of a man named Koenig. Mm-hmm. And I thought, this is amazing. Because Eduard von Hartmann, he is sometimes labeled as an antinatalist. Yeah. But he wasn't an antinatalist. No, had, not at all. Not, not only did he have children, um, yeah. his um, his world picture was very similar to Schopenhauer's yeah. world picture, very metaphysical. Anyway, um, I, so I discovered the footnote about Koenig and I tried to, to get a copy of him, 
which was impossible. Yeah. So I checked um, Hamburg's university library. They said they would have a copy, but I might not check it out. Mm. If I wanted to, I could copy it inside the building. I did that. Next difficulty, um, the script isn't the script we, we use today, but Gothic script. Oh, no. Okay. Which is completely different from from Roman script. Yeah. Um, luckily, I'm I'm able to read it, even though many Germans couldn't couldn't read it. I was I was amazed. Yeah. Here he was, um, an early modern anti-natalistic thinker. Yeah. Who who had thought through things uh, we thought until recently had only been discovered maybe in the in the nineties. Yeah. And uh, well, <clears throat> I was I was I was I was electrified. And uh, I decided um, I have to publish on him. More people have to know about his about his existence. Yeah. Thank goodness you did. Um, what what is uh, the full title of the work? His his neo, neo uh, nihilism uh, book. What is it called? Yes, it's called yeah. it's called um, neo neo nihilism. Yeah. And uh, as, as far as I remember, it's it's a very long title, and the title you find anti-militarism anti yeah and uh i'm not quite sure i, I don't have the complete title present but it's uh, okay. anti-militarism anti sexual education yeah and Something and what like that. okay what wonderful and and what year do you believe it was written uh what i copied was um the second edition published in the year uh, 1903 but as far as i got it he had published um, uh, editions before that okay. under a different pseudonym, Quartz, yeah. in the year uh, 1894. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Incredible, incredible find. Um, what's so special about Koenig? I mean, what is it about his work that separates him from antinatalist thinkers of the past and makes him so much more you know, similar and familiar to the antinatalism yeah. that we know today? Yeah. Well, as, as, as opposed to Schopenhauer, he wasn't um, metaphysical at all. Yeah. He's modern. Mm -hmm. There is no, his uh, thinking isn't overarched by, 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 by metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And um, he comes to the gist of antinatalism. What he wants us to do is to seize procreation um, such that mankind ceases to exist um, as quickly as possible. Yeah, he doesn't want us to fade out over the, the course of several hundred years. He wants us to seize procreation immediately. Yeah, so that in about 150 years, there is no human left on Earth. Um, what is interesting about him, he is not he is not that crazy guy who develops crazy ideas. He was yeah. a medical he was a medical doctor. Mm hmm. And um, he had been traveling many countries. He was familiar with um, Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. Wow. He had also been familiar with um, a series of religions. He knew Buddhism and Hinduism, um, Islam, and Christianity. So he was able to compare. And um, as a medical doctor, of course, he was familiar with um, human suffering. Yeah. He had direct contact to the fiercest forms of, of human suffering, yeah. as opposed to many other people who yeah. only see on the bright side of life until they become ill as well. Yeah. So that makes him special. And on top of that, he was an internationalistic um, activist. Yeah. Just a few months ago, I read um, his study about birth control written by a French guy. Mm -hmm. And in which he also mentions Koenig. Oh, wow. Saying that Koenig was active not only in Germany, but also in France. Okay. That he mastered uh, the French language and uh, distributed pamphlets in favor of antinatalism. And all of this around the year 1900, which is incredible. Absolutely. And there are, there are traces. Um, Koenig has left traces. Um, there is a French lady, a suffragette and an animals, animal rights activist. Her name is Madame Huyot. Mm -hmm. She is French. And she agitated in the footsteps as Koenig 
of Koenig and seems to have known uh, Mr. Koenig himself. Oh, wow. Okay. So we have to be aware of the fact that um, I'm now making an allusion to Corona. Mm -hmm. we, are, we, ha we are already the second wave of internationalism. There yeah. was a wave of internationalism a century before we, you and I existed. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Amazing. Um, what does this term that Koenig came up with uh, mean exactly, neo-nihilism? A, a term that I think would actually be sort of rejected by modern antinatalists, because a lot of most, I mean, there's a very large portion of antinatalists that do consider themselves uh, moral nihilists, unfortunately. But I mean, there's a great many more that reject that completely. So uh, what, 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 what do you make of this term that he created? Um, he doesn't give us um, a downright definition of his term neo okay. nihilism, but I think um, what he thinks is uh, is important about nihilism is um, it is built in the forecourt of annihilation. Okay. Nihilism, according to him, seems to have much to do with um, annihilation. So it's a new concept, a new concept of the annihilation of mankind, not by not by the use of weapons, not because we destruct ourselves, but because we abstain from any further procreation. Therefore, oh. neo-annihilation, nihilism. Okay, okay, I think I understand. Um, is further research into Koenig something that you want to continue to pursue? I'd love to, yeah. yes. Frankly speaking, I'd love to, ever more since I stumbled upon that uh, French book. Yeah on uh, birth uh, restrictions mm -hmm. because that was only the second trace I discovered about about Koenig. Yeah. And I'm sure he must have left more traces. Yeah. And I'd, I'd love to I'd love to discover who he actually was because it should yeah. be possible um, since he was a medical doctor he, he must have left more traces. They have to be out uh, there. Yeah. Yes. There have to be more traces, yeah. and uh, I'd love I'd love to voyage um, following following his traces in in France and and Germany. Yes, I, absolutely. I hope that you will do that. And uh, yeah, he's somebody that maybe you know I could I could see somebody making like a biopic about him one day or something like that. That'd be <laughs> that'd be, that'd be, that'd be amazing. Would be great, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this might be kind of an odd question, um, but do you know what the current like copyright status of his book is, uh, Neo Nihilism? Um, do you think it might be possible that we could try to petition for some sort of reprint? Because I, I want to read it. We definitely could. We yeah. definitely could. According to to German to European law, okay. I think after. I don't know. I'm not quite sure. At, at least since after since his book appeared a hundred years ago, more than yeah. hundred years ago, yeah. there will be no copyright. Okay. What we had to do is to get um, a clean, a clean copy. Okay. And somebody would, somebody would have to transcribe the Gothic, Gothic script into Roman letters. Okay. Um, I could do that, but it would be very time consuming. Let me tell you. Of course, of course. All right. Well, hope may, maybe in the in the distant future, a, a project to, to look forward to. We'll yes, see. and once once we have a clean copy, the translation yeah. process would be easy because okay. um, his German is is, is 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 simple. He doesn't use um, many technical terms. It's very simple German, which can be understood by everybody. Okay. Well, I'll make it one of my projects to find a copy. <laughs> Absolutely, I I love doing that kind of thing. So I'll do my you best. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, um, moving on, I'd like to ask you just a few questions about the future of antinatalism. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about the past, um, but I'd, you know, I'd love to ask you sort of what the future look, uh, looks like for the subject. Um, and I'm sure this is a subject that you and I could discuss for many days, many weeks, many months and beyond. So I'll Certainly. attempt to keep... Yes, <laughs> so I'll attempt to keep this, sub, this, uh, this section to only a few questions. Um, what in your opinion, does the future of antinatalism look like? Do you see any giant shifts in antinatalist thinking on the horizon at the minute? What I do see is um, a natural ally of antinatalism. Okay. I get the impression that um, the Fridays for Future movement and what is more, the whole eco movement mm -hmm. is a natural ally of antinatalism. Why? Because um, 
um, the people who are demonstrating for for a greener earth yeah. actually are asking for what I call in my handbook um, the hospitality principle. Okay. This is um, a semi strict form of internatalism. It goes as follows. Before you, future parents, have <laughs> new children, please see to it that our earth in which we have to live becomes hospitable yeah. with um, less pollution, free, fewer wars, fewer weapons of mass destruction. So please wait having new children until the earth um, has changed. Yeah. And this, of course, might, might imply never to have children because it doesn't look like the earth um, will change that mm. way. Mm -hmm. So therefore, um, the Fridays for Future movement, the ecological movement, deep ecology um, are a natural ally of internationalism, and we as internationalists um, should try and um, contact the movement. Okay. And ask for alliance. Yeah. Of course, it's it's uh, it's always on the assumption that those people are ready to talk morals, right? Because from a moral point of view, it'll be easy um, to defend antinatalism. Right. Okay. Um, one element of antinatalist thinking that has indeed shifted over the last ten. 12 years or so, starting arguably with Benatar um, and quite expanded upon by yourself, uh, antinatalism originating in other mediums such as video and of course the creation of ethalism is the idea that antinatalism really should not just apply to human life but in fact all sentient life. Now I know the inclusion of all sentient life is something that you yourself have written a lot about and something you are very much in agreement with. I'm curious not only to learn uh, more of your personal thoughts in reg regards to the shift away from uh, antinatalism only dealing with human life and or human extinction, but also curious if you know of uh, any historical antecedents that support this newer form of antinatalism. The closest I've come to finding anything even remotely that resembles this is the work of Al-Ma'ari, al uh, which of course is still quite like, wildly different. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I'm a big fan of Arthur Schopenhauer, I must admit. Yeah. Uh, not only because he was um, a precursor or a pre antinatalist but also he took seriously um, the suffering of animals. Yeah, yeah. He is among the first philosophers, um, if I'm not mistaken, the, the big, among the big philosophers yeah. who took serious um, the, the suffering of animals. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it cannot be defended to just um, to just take into account human beings. Yeah. Because suffering is suffering, as um, Peter Singer has, has shown famously. He's not an antinatalism, right. antinatalist, but he has shown famously that uh, we have to take into account the suffering of animals. So there is um, um, a, a tradition overarching philosophy from at least Arthur Schopenhauer to Peter Singer, okay. which um, is prodding us to take into, into account animals. And that, yeah. is, that ex explains why I personally think um, we shouldn't just talk about human beings, yes. but we should talk about the prevention of further animals coming into existence. Yes, yes. And I, of course, agree with that very strongly. Um, you know, adding to that, I mean, I, what we're about to speak of next is a giant topic that we could spend many podcasts discussing, you know, just just about this. Uh, so, you know, perhaps we'll just skirt to this as a as, as a way forward. Um, okay. I apologize. I forget where exactly this statement was taken from. You've made the following statement before somewhere and other statements like it. By sterilizing animals, we can free them from being slaved to their instincts and from uh, bringing more and more captive creatures into the cycle of being born, um, contracting parasites 
it's aging, falling ill, and dying, eating, and being eaten. Um, I have also advocated this quite a lot, particularly as it applies to wild animal interventionalism um, in the pursuit of, of sentient extinction. However, since uh, speaking on this very podcast with both David Benatar and in Mendham ab about you know sterilizing animals, I learned that they both don't seem to think that it's possible to fully solve the problem of ending wild animal suffering purely in this way. Um, it's a very difficult question, I know it's, uh, but if humans were truly on their way out, like we're about to go extinct in some real antinatalist world, antinatalist society, let's say, what would you do if the only available solution were to find like the best uh, way of euthanizing the remaining animal life? Or do you, do you think that would be acceptable? Or do you think that antinatalists would have, an, uh, do you have, sorry, do you think ob antinatalists would have the obligations to do that at that point to make sure suffering ended um, on the planet once and for all in this literally last chance we would ever have to uh, to do it in some humane way? Or should antinatalists revert to some sort of like vehement 2.0 approach at this point and allow the remaining animals to uh, inherit the earth as Les Knight would would uh, love to see? Uh, what is, what is What in your opinion is the right thing mm -hmm. to do? That's a very important question. Um, let me say first, I think there are, we always have to consider two levels of moral thinking, level one and level two. Mm -hmm. When we talk about level two, we are talking about morals in a very theoretical way. Yeah. We do not take into account that we are beings that have, which have, who have um, ordinary lives. We don't take into account that we are affected by emotions, yeah. um, that we live, sometimes live inside families, we have, we have parents, some internationalists may have children and so on and so yeah. on. I don't, yeah. I don't have children. Yeah. Um, I'm a cat holder. Mm -hmm. And let me elaborate on this. He is 20 by now. Oh. He's not suffering that much. Yeah. But I know yeah. that on level two of moral thinking, I should euthanize him. Yeah, I should it. I should do it, yeah. but I can't. Yeah, because because of the emotions that have built up in the last during during the last uh, two decades. Mm -hmm. On level one of moral thinking, um, I and so there are two levels. On one level, I could do it. On the other yeah. level, I'm not I'm not able to do it. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about a situation in which um, just a bunch of um, human beings survives, let's say 50 human beings, and they had the, the capacity to euthanize how many animals? Just give me, give me a guess. Uh, let's, I, uh, let's get really controversial. There's a couple of million, uh, no, I don't know. There, there's, yeah, there's, there's animals of some number in, uh, perhaps in the ocean, like somewhere that we wouldn't be able to, you know, that it's just are beyond our capability for whatever reason to mm -hmm. sterilize in some sort of way or in, in some other way manipulate the environment where they would cease to have, have to procreate. Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, a, a few thousand, let's say, or a few hundred. Okay. So yeah. 50 people definitely wouldn't be enough to euthanize thousands of animals. The mm -hmm. lifetime wouldn't be enough. So if we are talking about the dis disappearance of all those animals, we would talk about a mass extinction, bombing mm -hmm. them, poisoning them, or what have you. And I think um, those people wouldn't be able to do it. Mm -hmm. If I were among those people, I wouldn't be able to do it. I wouldn't be able to bombard um, a bunch of 25 cows, for example. Yeah. First of all, I wouldn't, I could never be sure, will it work? Will those 25 cows disappear in the fraction of a second? That would be justifiable mm -hmm. uh, on, mor on, on, on level moral two. Yeah. But in reality, I could never be sure whether or not it'll, it'll happen. So I would hesitate. I would be very hesitant. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's a, yeah, yeah. on level two, on level yeah. two, if everything is theoretical, and there is a button, the famous button yes. on level two, those people who have no emotions and in a world which is completely fictitious, they should press the button. 
but right. it's not it's not realistic. Well, I mean, it, it, again, we could we could spend many many podcasts going through this. I mean, it gets into all kinds of things where you know uh, to to even sterilize all the animals or to perhaps euthanize them would it require the creation of a a new generation could it be exactly. could it be exactly. achieved by one yes. generation of human beings yes. or would we have to produce a generation of human beings for this specific person a purpose and then also the other question of what do we do about the planet you know do we do we have to get rid of the planet because if we don't will life you know arise on it again of, or some sort mm -hmm. so it gets into there's those types of things do you have any uh, thoughts on that on those two things um Yes, you're now, you're now addressing the, the topic uh, man as a guardian of animals. Yeah, yeah. And of course, in a, in a better world, man should act as a guardian of animals. Yeah. Man shouldn't disappear from Earth before the last of animals has disappeared. It's like in Buddhism, right. where there are bodhisattvas, enlightened human beings, who shouldn't go into nirvana before average human beings have um, reached uh, the cycle of non-birth. Mm -hmm. But all these um, reflections are very theoretical. Yeah. And uh, what we can do about animals is um, diminishing the amount of meat we are eating, right. becoming vegetarians and vegans. For example, yeah. there are approximately 1.2 billion, if not 2 billion cows out there. If everybody stopped eating meat, those two billion cows would disappear. Yeah, yes. They would go extinguished. The same goes for, for the house swine. Countless house swines, um, pigs would, would disappear. Mm -hmm. So um, we are able to, in a realistic scenario, to make many races, many animal races extinct. Yeah. It's very realistic. It's yeah. at the tip of our fingers. Yeah. It's an emergency, <laughs> is what it, it is. is. Especially with uh, with coronavirus. I mean, you don't want any more of this. Stop, stop uh, breeding the animals and making Ex exactly, these right, exactly. right. Um, okay, well, thank you so much for your thoughts on that and for engaging in in these hypotheticals. They are of great interest to me. Um, so I appreciate your thoughts on that. I, you know, perhaps in the future, I'd love to speak with you about oh, it yes. more. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, thank you. Um, so let me just, uh, speak a little bit about, uh, you know, just what what awaits you in the future, uh, sort of with your work. Um, are, are, are you continuing your research in antinatalism? And if so, do you have any new book projects uh, or article projects in the future that, uh, that are of particular interest that you're excited about? Perhaps. Uh, let me tell you, I, in the year 2002, I published a book which is called Alien Introduction to Philosophy. Yes. That book, um, every chapter of that book is dedicated to one philosopher. And every chapter starts with um, a few quotations on what uh, the philosopher had to say on extraterrestrial intelligence. The last chapter of that book is dedicated to a question which I had forgotten in my former publications on antinatalism. Namely, should ET, should extraterrestrial intelligence exist? My answer is, of course, is no. Extraterrestrial, we, we should be glad if extraterrestrial intelligence did not exist. Yeah. Why? Because um, presumably they would be sentient beings. They would suffer too. Mm -hmm. And a world with um, fewer sentient beings is, bad, is better than a world with um, more sentient beings. Yeah. So I would like to to elaborate on that question and okay. de dedicate it more, dedicate more pages to it. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, I, I did see you did a, you did a video of some kind um, about some of your extraterrestrial work. It was in German, so I, I, co I couldn't understand it, but it was very interesting. I'll perhaps link it when I post this episode. That um, is right, yes. Yeah. Do you, um, may I, do you believe in alien life? Is that something that you, you believe in? Unfortunately, I think um, it's very probable that there are inhabited planets. Uh, okay. In recent years, astronomers have discovered thousands and thousands of other planets which are orbiting uh, suns and the so-called habitable life zone. Mm -hmm. So as, as opposed to 40 years ago, there is a high probability, unfortunately, today that millions of planets 
are filled with um, suffering beings. I'm very, I'm very sorry about this, but uh, we cannot do much about it. Do you, do you, well, I mean, again, this is another topic we could get onto forever, but I mean, it, do you believe that uh, antinatalists, you know, that would be something that we'd have to stick around to do something about? Or do you believe that, no, we should go extinct and only take care of the problems that we have access to, so to speak? Um, science in this case comes to our help because right. of the because of the interstellar distances. Right, right. Very often we are talking about hundreds, if not thousands of light years, yeah. which is to say um, even communication would take hundreds or thousands of years. Right. Right. Whereas it would take us only a few decades to, to disappear from Earth. <laughs> so that, thank goodness we're not going to have to deal with that. Any kind, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so anti, I'm just, you know, antinatalism is definitely something that you, you wish to pursue for as long as you can. Am I yes, correct in yes. that? All right. Like wonderful. That. That makes me happy to, to hear. Um, I also just wanted to ask you briefly about your YouTube channel, Lentil Vegetation, uh, where you post your songs about antinatalism, uh, which I, I, I really I really like a lot. And I, lo I, you know, I love to see people, you know, they're, they mainly work in one medium, but they branch out into other mediums. I love seeing that. Um, so, yeah. And so can you tell me a little bit about your antinatalist musical endeavors? And I wanted to also ask if you have ever performed live with these songs. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh... Yes, for me it's a very it's a very um, bad situation now that oh. Oh, uh, yes. nobody nobody is has um, the possibility to appear on stage. Um, the last time I s I sang an internationalist song on stage was probably last year in December. Okay. Um, then I, from the last time I sang my song, um, better no, better better never never to have been. Okay. And uh, I introduced that song saying we are of the opinion it would be that it would be better never to have existed. Yeah. And after that, my the drummer approached me mm -hmm. and he told me, Karim, you must never say so again oh, because no. I'm not of your opinion. I uh -huh. tolerate I tolerate your antinatalism, but <laughs> Please, in future, don't speak about we. It's you, uh -huh. which which is great because because um, it's, it shows it is possible to to defend antinatalism. Yeah, even together with um, people who have no opinion or no good opinion on yeah. antinatalism. Yeah, it's a good sign. Yeah, no, yeah, I can I can appreciate that. Somehow, antinatalism has reached um, the middle of society. We just have a couple of questions left, really. Um, you talked a little bit about this before, um, though you give some great insight into this in your interview in Antinatalism Magazine number four. I'm always interested in finding out how antinatalism, you know, exists in different parts of the world. Um, again, you, you spoke a lot about this in, in the magazine, but what what is antinatalism like in Germany? Is there anything like an antinatalist community in Germany? Does Germany have its own history of antinatalism at all? And I, I apologize. I know, I know you spoke about some of this, but... Uh, it, it is of great interest to me, so I'd love to. Oh, you're, you're, yeah. you're mostly welcome. Um, just two weeks after I had, I had published um, my first book on antinatalism, should mankind ex exist in 1995? Yeah. I, re I received a letter from a German antinatalist who was electrified. Yeah. And who himself had thought there are no other antinatalists out there in Germany. Yeah. And I corresponded with him um, for about 20 years. Wow, okay. Then I learned there are even other antinatalists. Uh, some of them have published books. Um, there is Gunther Bleibohm in the city of Flensburg, mm -hmm. who is an antinatalist. Unfortunately, there is no, as far as I know, there is no um, interlinked group of antinatalists. Yeah. So in that respect, the United States, um, might have reached much more when it comes to internet to organized internationalism. Um, I know I, the only thing I know of is there is a there is a small Facebook group of German antinatalists and there's a couple of YouTubers. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have to send you links to all that later. But yeah, okay. So th th thank you for that. It's interesting. Um, it, this is a pretty obvious question, but do you consider yourself an antinatalist activist? Um, 
And as much as I as I publish on the topic of antinatalism, yeah. And as much as I tell people I am an antinatalist, I yeah. think I am an activist as good as as good as I can. Okay, I'd yeah. like to do a little bit more of um, activism. I'd like yeah. to go out on the street and wear t-shirts together with other people or yeah. give talks about internetism. That is what I did actually. I great. I'd like to have one of those. Yes. Uh, in fact I gave I gave lectures on the topic of internetism. So um oh, okay. all in all I may be called an, an activist, yes. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, do you believe that antinatalists need to start taking organiz organizing more seriously? Um, I think it's high time. What do you think about that? It is. I've heard there even is um, an antinatalist party in Great Britain. I don't know much about it, but as far as I know, they are serious and uh, they are engaged in um, in the country's elections. They uh, so it was called the ANP, the Antinatalist Party. Um, it was started by a YouTuber called Self Immolator, um, and it's now d defunct. Unfortunately, it really oh, I'm sorry to hear it. yeah, it was sad. It only really lasted a year. Um, there was some press on it, but it just kind of fizzled out. But mm -hmm. yeah, perhaps something like that in the future. Um, in a very interesting podcast that you did sometime back with imagineaworldpod.com, you talk about an ad campaign uh, you would like to see where governments put up signs and posters saying things like procreation is deadly. In the absence of this being a governmental project, is this something that you'd like to work on like with an antinatalist community or is this something you'd like to develop more? Absolutely. I'd like to elaborate on um, the what I call the litmus test, the antinatalistic yeah. litmus test. Yeah. Um, it's a very simple question, a very simple sentence. Um, most people would subscribe to the sentence that um, one must never act in such a way that a human being will die as a consequence of one's actions. Yeah. yeah. And it should be very easy to propagate this sentence and to make people think about it. Yeah. Actually, governments who allegedly care about our well-being should in the end at the end of the day inform their citizens um, that if we act in such a way that a new human being begins to exist yeah that human being will die inevitably under um, cruel circumstances very often yes Yes, absolutely. I, I, I think the idea of an antinatalist litmus test is a great idea. Uh, I know like in Mendham has brought up the idea of like, you know, parents should have to write an environmental impact statement or just ask, you know, the question of like, can you justify your procreation with anything that doesn't have something to do with the selfishness of it all? So I think statements like that or like uh, even little tests like that are, are, would definitely be a very good tool for us to definitely, try to develop. Definitely. Yeah. Um, what do you feel like antinatalists are doing right so far? And what do you feel like antinatalists are doing wrong currently? What are the most important things that antinatalists should be doing right now? I think um, antinatalists should be should be sober. OK, yes. They um, shouldn't there shouldn't there shouldn't be too much quarreling about among antinatalists. Oh boy! So, yeah. <laughs> um, so because because it's it's important because um, yeah. because for many people, and even though it has reached society's middle, for many people, antinatalism still is outlandish. Yeah. And if on top of that, people become aware of the fact that there is a lot of more than average quarrelling going on among <laughs> antinatalists, yeah. um, they become appalled. Yeah. So in a way. Um, Antinatalists should be kind of role models, and yeah. I guess many, many antinatalists are role models when it comes to their everyday behavior. Yeah, yeah. I'm convinced. It's a difficult thing because on one hand, I absolutely agree with you, and um, you know, in, in, in a large sense, that's sort of why I started this podcast or, or that's what this podcast has kind of grown into um, is that, you know, I want antinatalists to talk to each other and we have so many differences and we do have a lot of things to argue about. And some of those things are important to hash out, but more than anything, we need to collect and, and unify a little bit. Yes. So, yeah. Um, okay. So final question, what do you most hope for antinatalism to ultimately accomplish? 
Unfortunately, in the foreseeable future, antinatalism, antinatalistic activism will not be able to accomplish mankind's vanishing from this planet. But what we can achieve is, convince, is to convince ever more people that they abstain from having children. I'm absolutely sure we can accomplish this. And uh, I, for my part, I would be satisfied for if um, my whole book, on which I worked for about five years, yeah. convinced only one a single couple yeah. not to have children. That would be um, a very nice gift for me. Yeah. And if we work together, we can accomplish much more and we can convince many more people not to have children. Exactly. Okay, well, wonderful. Kareem, it has been such a true pleasure and honor for me to get a chance to speak with you today. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much for your time and for this larger insight to everything that you think and believe and do. Uh, I appreciate it tremendously. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Amanda. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, of course. Please follow Kareem Akurma at antinatalismblog.wordpress.com and to hear his music, subscribe to his YouTube channel, Lentil Vegetation. Also, make sure to check out the links in the description where you can find ways of purchasing his books. Thank you for listening to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. Once again, this has been Old Fan. You can find me at Forever Wolf Films on YouTube, as well as keep up with my daily antinatalist news updates at Antinatal News on Twitter. Please follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and email me at exploringantinatalism at gmail.com. The podcast can be listened to on our YouTube channel, Exploring Antinatalism Podcast, as well as Buzzsprout, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. And proudly announcing the official website for the Exploring Antinatalism Podcast, www.exploringantinatalism.com, has been completed and it is gorgeous. Designed by the amazing Visions Noirs. Please visit Visions Noirs at www.bialnoir.com and check out more of his links below. Podcast artwork donated by the incredible Life Sucks. If you would perhaps like to purchase one of the new Exploring Antinatalism t shirts by Life Sucks, please visit his Etsy page, www www.etsy.com slash shop slash life sucks publishing. All the best and bye for now.